Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Um, super excited for today. It's going to be fantastic. We got a lot of great content planned. Um, you know, some role playing, some objection handling, mindfulness stuff. It's going to be great. And we have a rock star panel today. Okay. So today we're going to talk about a very um, important topic um, for, I think, a lot of people on this webinar. So um, what we're going to be doing today is talking about poking the bear, how to eliminate the cost of inaction for prospects, right? So super important topic, um, really relevant right now. So very excited to get into it. Um, but before we do that, I want to just say a couple a couple things, housekeeping things, um, super straightforward, just kind of the boring stuff before we get into the gear. So first things first. Um, we know everyone is leading a very busy life, right? So if you need to leave, go have another meeting, go pick up the kids or, you know, put out a fire that the kids created. Um, that's all good. We will send you the recording at the end of the event today. So you can catch up on anything you missed. You're going to not want to miss anything. It's going to be great content. So um, everyone, thank you so much for being here. It means a lot to the sales hacker team and world and community. So um, we really appreciate you guys being here. Um, secondly, we want to hear who's here today, who's hanging with us. Okay, so as I'm sure you all know, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's the chat box. Please start just putting your names in the chat, um, you know, where you're from, LinkedIn profile, company, uh, your title, and just let us know kind of what you're, uh, wh who's hanging with us, essentially. Um, and also, Secondly, please turn your panelists, uh, sorry, the bottom, the little blue tube there from panelists to panelists and attendees um, so we can all see the chat and kind of really um, get going there. So we have some people coming in here, Hunter, Fort Collins, uh, Jared from Grand Rapids, Matt, Richmond, Virginia. Oh, we're looking good. Now we're, 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 we're having a blast. Okay, sweet. And I think that is it. One last thing. We do these, these events for the community, so we love the engagement. We want you to engage with what we're doing here um, and what we're speaking to. So we, have, we do have a lot of content to get through today, which I will quickly hand over to our panel to start going through. But please, at the bottom, there's the Q&A um, tab as well. I will be manning that, so I'll be kind of the voice of the community. Please drop your questions in there, and kind of at the end of the... Uh, of the event today, about we're trying to try five, 15, 10 minutes. We'll try and answer all the questions that uh, that come up. So, I think that's all the boring stuff out of the way. Um, without further ado, I would love to introduce our rock star panel today. We got Josh Braun, uh, Mark McWaters, and Kendra Warlow. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So excited to have you guys. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Um, well, great. So without further ado, I will uh, let these guys kind of start going here. Please let me, uh, please hit the Q&A for any questions for the end. Um, and other than that, I think it's uh, time to rock and roll. Let's actually start with a pop quiz. I'm going to ask you a question. So imagine you're an SDR or an AE full cycle. It's your job to book meetings. You're about five meetings behind. It's getting to the end of the week. You cold call a prospect. Prospect picks up the phone. You get out your opening line and your prospect says, I can't talk right now. You caught me at the gym. And the question I have for you is, what do you say? So I asked this question on LinkedIn several months ago and close to 200 people responded and respondents fell into kind of two buckets. One, I'm going to call a pressure-based response. Pressure-based responses is this the salesperson trying to pressure or get the prospect to book a meeting. So, hey, I know I caught you at the gym. Can I have 37 seconds to tell you why I called? When can I call you back? Pressure-based responses. Um, the other response was a no-pressure-based response, which was the rep not having an agenda, not trying to get the prospect to do anything. So see if you could label whether these responses are pressure-based or no-pressure-based. Here's the first one. And you can put it in the chat. 
And see, Mikey, is this a, is this a, people are saying this is a pressure-based response, meaning is the rep trying to get something or is it a non-pressure-based response? What are people saying, Mikey? Pressure yeah, or non-pressure? Pressure, pressure. Pressure, yeah, because asking, you know, pressure. for time. Here's another one. Yeah. Pressure or no pressure? Pressure. You got yeah, you can see the tell there. Would love a flash of your time. Yeah. Uh, what about this one? More pressure. More pressure. Again, yeah. asking for time. What about this one? No, no pressure. <laughs> or, or this one. Yeah. Uh, doing back or buys. Uh, the question becomes, out of the close to 200 people that responded, all salespeople, what percentage of the responses do you think were pressure-based versus non-pressure-based? If you had to take a guess, what are people saying, Mikey? 80% pressure, 90% pressure, 99% pressure. Wow, it's, it's really up there. What do you think, Mark? What, what would you say, Mark? I was going to go more like low 70s. Let's low say. 70s, giving people yeah. the benefit of the doubt? What about you, Kendra? What do you think? You, th you kind of know, probably. I think you've seen this before. <laughs> so yeah. 84 and 16. Uh, what's causing the pressure, right? The, the, the pressure is caused by commission breath, right? Salespeople have a quota. <laughs> they have attainment. They've got to get to the top of the leaderboard. Um, pressure is also caused by exotic trips that you get in if you go into the president's club. Um, pressure is also created by happy years. Uh, this is a direct quote that I heard from someone yesterday. Uh, if we can only get them to see the demo, they'll buy it. Because as salespeople, we love our products. Uh, it's called happy ears, also known as confirmation bias. We're so in love with what we're selling that we can't imagine how our prospects aren't as excited as we are. And that comes through on the call. The problem is that when we're moving really fast and we're trying to get people to do something, we're selling like sellers. And you look at any sales process, it's really a straight line. In fact, I think there's a very popular sales trainer out there that calls the straight line persuasion system as if people are supposed to move down this line like little robots from the beginning and to the end. Problem is when we make a cold call, it's kind of more like this. Uh, people really aren't thinking about it. And so when we actually pressure them to move forward and we're moving faster than they're ready to move, that's when the pressure's created and that's when people always pull away. Um, I'll actually prove it to you. Imagine that you're in the mall and you're minding your own business and a aggressive mall kiosk person says to you, can I ask you a question? What do you do? Um, if you're like most people, like Kendra over there, <laughs> You kind of put your hands up and you pick up the pace a little bit because you know if you say, what can I do for you? You're going to be sold some sea scrub that you probably don't want. The thing is that talking people into things just doesn't ever work. And yet that's what we try to do when we cold call all the time because we have commission breath and we want to go on fancy exotic trips in the president's club. It's called a backfire effect. You, you tell a teenager to stop smoking and they're going to smoke even more. So let's actually talk about what talking people into things actually sounds like on a cold call, just so you can sense the language, right? So typical language that I hear after listening to thousands of cold calls, these are just some phrases that I've lifted and I've redacted some names uh, for confidentiality, but hey, this is Adam with ABC. And I'm reaching out to discuss how our solutions can help you with your business. And it's implied that our solutions can in fact help you with your business. And there again is the push. And whenever people feel the push, they pull away. So do you, so does everyone. Another phrase, uh, I call it, you got a case of the uh, looking to's. Uh, if you got a case of looking to's, you're trying to look to, look to get something. Looking to get, it's a case of looking at the gets. 15 minutes um, on your calendar to formally introduce myself and my company. These are actually real scripts that I've seen and heard um, on cold calls. Um, these are how people are responding to objections. I'm not interested. And this is a typical response that I see, a typical rebuttal. What if, I, what if I told you I could do this? Would you be interested? Um, again, you can feel the pressure and the pitch. Um, what if I told you this was interesting? Would you be interested? It's the same kind of thing. It's going to kind of repel people. When you talk like that, things get real wavy on a cold call. It's like this big tug of war happening. You're like in this rough ocean, swinging and bobbing across the top of the waves, and it feels really choppy. It doesn't feel good for you. It makes your heart go really high. 
And it certainly doesn't feel good on your prospect to be in rough waters. So what we're going to talk about today is a different approach that actually gets you down over here to the bottom of the ocean where it's nice and calm and flat. You can see we have someone down there that's actually on our call today. That's Kendra. Hey, Kendra, how are you? How, how, down, how deep are you there, Kendra? Are you like 50 meters? What, how deep is this calm part of the ocean? How, how um, probably, probably 60 feet. So we're about 60 feet down and the bottom of the ocean is a calm place where we actually are going to release this attachment that we have to getting something. And oddly enough, when you release the attachment of trying to get to something, you actually can cold call in a way that's actually more calm for you and actually more calm for your prospect. Rather than setting your intent to book a meeting, you're actually going to change your intent a little bit. And it might sound counterintuitive, but you're actually going to detach from the outcome and not assume that your product is for everyone. And when you detach from the outcome and you are indifferent to how the call ends, you actually behave and say things very differently. If you're attached to the outcome, you say and behave in ways that, see, that feel pushy, like the aggressive mall kiosk person. This clip from Seinfeld embodies what it's like to have a detached mindset. I want to play it for you real quick. Jerry. Yes? I've been doing a lot of thinking. Uh-huh. Well, I don't think we should see each other anymore. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> what? No, it's fine. No problem. I'll meet somebody else. Oh, really? Sure. See? Things always even out for me. Huh? It's fine. Anyway, it's been really nice dating you for a while. And, uh, good luck. Yeah, me too. We'll be coming around. <laughs> So that's, that's, the, that's the detached mindset, right? You're, you're sort of, you obviously care about what you sell, but you're indifferent to the outcome. It's okay if someone wants to talk to you. Um, it's also okay um, if they don't. Um, I want you to adopt a new mantra when you're making cold calls. Rather than booking the meeting and getting the sale and overcoming objections, this is the new mantra. Uh, let go of assuming and go into the call thinking that not everyone you call is gonna want what you have, and that's okay. Uh, you don't control other people. You don't control how they interpret your message. You don't control how they respond to your message. You only control what you say and how you say it. The new intent when you make a cold call is to just get to the truth behind every conversation you have with someone which is, yes, they would like to learn more, share more, and continue the conversation, or no, they don't at this time, which doesn't mean all the time. Uh, just because a door is closed, and just because they don't want to book a meeting right now, doesn't mean you can't create an opening and plant the seed, where you can then do a subsequent follow-up that might continue the conversation. So you don't have to walk down the aisle on the first encounter. But if you start to rush things too quickly and you ask someone on a first date if you can meet their parents, chances are they probably won't want to talk to you again. So this idea of planting seeds. Ironically enough, when you adopt this mindset, not as a tactic to get something, but truly as a philosophy that you have, where you're leaning back, you actually get to more truth because prospects don't feel like they're being sold and manipulated. And because of that, you have more conversations. And the more conversations you have, ironically enough, the more money you make and the less time you spend chasing. Um, contrary to popular belief, the best reps that I know don't have big fat pipelines. They have skinny pipelines that close. And they're not chasing people that have they thought expressed interest. So this detached mindset. Mindset's super important. We're gonna transition to Kendra in a little bit. She's gonna talk about how she does this. But the question is, well, well how do I do that? Um, I thought what we would do, rather than talking about hypotheticals, actually show you how this is done um, in a couple of different examples. One, a cold call that Kendra made to me several months ago when she was working at Gravy Solutions. And then two, I've actually 
constructed a cold call script that Mark has not seen yet using the same approach for his company. And we're going to get his reaction to it. And again, he's going to be very br brutally honest with me. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so just by way of some context to understand this, before we cold call anyone, we have to have a hypothesis about what sucks before and what changes for the better after. Because everybody you call is getting the job done today somehow. You have to know something that they don't know. What is it that you know that they don't know that's costing them something? If your prospect doesn't do anything, what terrible no good thing happens? So by way of that backdrop, I sell a couple of knowledge products. I have this thing called the Badass B2B Growth Guide. I've got some courses. I've got these sales objection flashcards. And before gravy, if someone visits the Badass B2B Growth Guide page and they try to pay via Stripe and for whatever reason their credit card fails, um, I try to recover it. Maybe I try to call them up. Maybe I try to email them. Maybe I have some automated process that does that, which is really not very human and cold. The DIY recovery process, especially for someone like me, is very time consuming. It takes away from my ability to write. My writing brings me revenue. And ultimately, I'll lose the customer because I don't do it and it slips through the cracks. I'm not even thinking about it. So that's the story before. You have to have that for your prospect. And then after gravy, someone visits the same page, they try to pay, their payment fails, and human beings at gravy on my behalf reach out. And because they're humans, and they're not robots, and because they're doing it consistently, they're able to recover payment and I win the customer. So that's a backdrop in terms of what's happening. Once you have that hypothesis, and only once you have that hypothesis, and it's crispy, and it's specific, you can then make the cold call. This is called the poke the bear approach because we're actually gonna poke the bear, meaning we're gonna shine a light on something that the prospect might not know about that can hurt them. And again, the basis of this is, what does it cost your prospect if they do nothing? If you can't answer that question, it's gonna be really tough to make the call. And when we work through Mark's cold call script, which we're gonna do next, I'm gonna show you the specific text, uh, steps I did to write it without having any product training. I really have never used Mark's product before. I'm gonna show you exactly how I did it and we'll get, Mark's, we'll get Mark's take on it. So step number one is this, it's called permission. We're actually gonna role play this, but before we do, Kendra, when you pick up the phone from a mindset perspective, like what are you doing to get to that bottom of the ocean to kind of be so calm? Because that's what I noticed when you were on the call with me. Yeah. So the first thing we'll do is actually do 30 seconds and take everybody under the sea with us. So I want everybody to sit up really tall. Take your hands, put them on your lap. And we're going to breathe in for five seconds. We're going to hold it for two at the top and we're going to breathe out for five seconds all together. So everybody can close your eyes or lower your gaze. And in for five, one, two, three, four, Five, hold for two, five, four, three, two, one. Let's do this together five more times. Hold for two, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Last one. And then gently bring yourself back to the screen. So tell me in the chat how you feel now. So this is one of the ways that I prepare before I do cold calls. And this helps my detachment because when we learn why we're attached first through mindfulness, right? And mindfulness being awareness of the present moment, not living in the what ifs of the future, nor revisiting and revising our regrets of the past, awareness of the present moment. Each of our calls is the opportunity to learn something new about the business, the person, and be able to provide space for them to feel comfortable enough to tell us the truth about how they're feeling, what's really happening at their business. And we're showing up gently curious to learn about them. 
And maybe if it's a fit, that's great. And maybe if it's not, we just met someone anyway. So before I got ready to call Josh, I did my my normal morning routine, pulled up his wonderful face on LinkedIn and dialed. Yeah, what's what's really interesting about what you said, Kendra, is that that mindset that you have, it affects what you say and your energy on the call, right? That's what I think made the call very different is that when you actually adopt that mindset of not being attached and knowing that you don't control other people, you just sound completely different on the phone. It's just more, it's more casual. And that's what struck me. And I get cold calls probably about 15 or 20 a week. Um, and most of them through no fault of anyone's you know, everyone's kind of focused on booking their meetings. They sound very hypey um, because they're focused on getting the, the meeting. Um, but I think when you're under the sea and you're kind of down there where it's tranquil and you're like, hey, I'm just going to call a bunch of different people and learn some stuff and be curious. And it's okay either way. And I'm letting go of the assumption that everyone needs what I have or that I want, everyone wants what I have. You just sound completely different. It's, it's a vibe. So to give you a sense of the yeah. vibe, we're actually going to take you through how she sounded. Exactly. So and then I'm going to talk to you about the psychology behind what, what, uh, what, what she's doing here. So the first part of the four-part script is what's called permission. And before we actually role play it, let me give you some context as to what it is because there's lots of ways to do it. But what we're going to do is we're going to use some phraseology and tonality to see if the prospect will allow us to continue to part two. The reason we're doing that is something called congruence. Um, when people say they'll give you a minute or two minutes, or you can talk, they're more likely to hear you out at least for the second part. Um, if you tell someone you'll pick them up at five o'clock and you don't, it feels bad. People wanna be in, incongruent with what they said. They want their words to be incongruent with their actions. So there's lots of ways to do this. There's literally a book that I wrote with 47 of them. Um, we're gonna show you the one that Kendra did, which is extremely unique and very Kendra, that you probably won't be able to replicate exactly. But after we get through this first part, I'll give you some ones that are a little bit more uh, maybe generic. So let's actually just go through it. I'm going to pick up the phone and we're going to go into the game, into the role play. We'll come in and out of gameplay. So hi, hi, this is Josh. Hi, Josh. It's Kendra from Gravy. I'm calling you from Starbucks. And I was wondering if you had a minute. <laughs> Starbucks, what are, you, what, are you, what are you drinking? I'm having an Americano. It's delicious. <laughs> that is exactly how the call sounded. And you can kind of notice uh, Kendra has a very like warm and friendly tonality, uh, natural for her, but there's different tonalities you can use, right? You can, another one you could say is, hey, hey, Josh, uh, I was on your LinkedIn and was hoping you could help me out for a moment. As long as it's not like this, hey, Josh, I was on your LinkedIn and I, look, I, I saw this, I was hoping, you, can you help me out for a moment? Well, that gets big up tone, right? So if you don't have that friendly friendly voice like Kendra have, if that doesn't feel you, very calm, confident, about 125 words a minute. Here's another one. Hey, Josh, uh, we've never met, but I was on your LinkedIn profile and was hoping to speak with you briefly. Do you have two minutes? Do you got a sec? Um, another fun one that a lot of people like is based on some stuff I learned from Chris Voss, which is to label the negative emotion people are thinking. He calls it an accusation audit. Could sound like this. Um, hey, Mark, Josh, you're, you're probably going to hate me because this is a cold call. Would you like to hang up or roll the dice? And notice my little laugh right there. And I have found, for me at least, seven, eight times out of 10, people will be like, ah, sure, sure, what do you want? Especially if you kind of say I, I like that one too. I like yeah. that one too. And so the key is you're going to pick this permission-based opener, right, that fits your personality. I would never do a cold call and say, hello, this is Kendra. <laughs> We've never spoken before, but do you have a minute? Like, that's just not me, right? But find this permission-based opener that fits you, right? Like the roll the dice one for me is also fun. This was genuinely because I was in line for coffee and I was like, great, we're calling. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, and so you will get, you know, probably about 10% of the time or 15 or whatever. Um, someone's saying, you know, they'll just hang up on you and there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, they also might say some other things that are very uh, nasty and mean. Uh, they might say something like, uh, hey, you know, you're calling me at 6.30 at night. And I don't want to talk to anyone at 6.30 at night, especially when you've called me four times. And you might not know how to respond to that. So let's actually role play that. And I'm going to show you how I would respond to that. Kendra's going to be the prospect. And she's going to have a very confrontational style coming at me. 
And I'm gonna show you how we're using the, the tongue-tied objection diffusing approach to just get to the bottom of the ocean, not try to overcome it, but to understand it. So Kendra's gonna push back. I'm gonna give my opener and Kendra's gonna push back and say it's 6.30 at night. I don't want a phone call from someone at 6.30 at night, especially when they call me three times in a row. So, uh, hey, hey, Kendra, uh, this is Josh. We've never met, but I was uh, hoping you could help me out for a moment. Yeah, Josh, you know what? Candidly, it's 6.30 at night and you've called me three times. So I, I don't have a moment for you. I apologize. I feel like such a jerk. I thought I was calling the East Coast. I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, this is, this is the West Coast. And out of role play for a second. So what we're doing here is we're just falling on the sword. Right? And you'll find that when you do that, and you just breathe in, take a little pause, and say, I'm so sorry, I feel like such a jerk, I thought I was calling the opposite coast. What you'll find most of the time someone says is, yeah, well, what do you need? Or how can I help you? Or like Kendra said, this is the West Coast. And again, it's not about closing, it's about creating an opening to see if we can't get a little space because the prospect is thinking we're about to sell and pitch them and they're upset at 6.30 potentially, right? So we're, we're trying to just validate that. Okay, so and now, go ahead, Kendra. Gosh, that, was, that was a great example there of just being human. These people woke up and put their pants on one leg at a time the same way that you did. They're just people and they just want to be treated like human beings also, not like a CFO, not like the head of HR, like a person. Yeah, and we're just being a little, being a little vulnerable as well. So, so again, most of the time when you do these permission-based openers with the right tonality, uh, you'll get someone to say, sure, how can I help you? And I do live cold calling on LinkedIn all the time. You can see this. We did them on Sales Hacker as well. We're going to now go to the second part where it's not about your value proposition. This is where most calls go off the rails because remember, nobody really cares about your product. They only care about their problems that they may or may not know about. So we're actually going to start with the problem which has nothing to do with your product's solution. And that's the because there's no assumptions. There's no, no assumptions. assumptions here. No assumptions. So for me, um, we're going to go back into role play and we're going to roll from, I'm going to give, I, I'm going to say to Kendra, yeah, sure. Hey, Kendra, how can I help you? And we're going to roll yeah. right into the problem. Um, so Kendra, yeah, it sounds like a great coffee. Um, how, how can I help you? Thanks, Josh. Hey, I speak with course creators all the time and they're losing, you know, what they tell me is six to 8% of their revenue month over month because of failed credit card payments. Okay. And pause. And we're going to see, this is going to roll right into part three, but that is a very clear, succinct hypothesis. She doesn't know if I'm experiencing that, but just based on people like me, um, of the problem that I might be experiencing. And she's doing it in one clear sentence. And she's talking about what I stand to lose. Uh, it's known as loss aversion, which is a stronger motivator than gain. If we're in a casino and I tell you heads or tails, heads you win 100, tails you lose 100, most people don't take that bet because the fear of loss is greater. And I have to say, tails you win 300, heads you lose 100 for you to take that bet. Here's some ways to structure that problem statement. I call these problem bridging phrases. You know, I speak with blanks. All, I, hey, Mark, I speak with VPs of sales all the time. And they tell me this. I often speak with triathletes who are trying to balance work and family life with training for an Ironman. And they tell me that they're spending 20 hours a week training. We, we call that divorce by triathlon. Right? That's a problem statement that a triathlete can relate to. Uh, we're, we're finding that. We're seeing that. We just saw this, uh, maybe you've seen this HBR study that shows X, Y, and Z. Again, right around a specific problem. Not optimize, not save time, not save money. Very specific, 6 to 8% month over month, losing money due to failed credit card transaction payments. The crispy is where it's at. When you're too vague, you're not believable because everyone says save time, save money. From there, we roll right into the poke the bear question, which is a question that's a little difficult for the person to answer on purpose. The aim is to get them to think a little differently about how they're getting the job done today and to pass the potato back so we can actually have a conversation. Um, and it sort of looks like this. I'm going to have Kendra take it from part two to part three. So we're going to role play it from part two to part three. We'll go back into the role play. Uh, sure, Kendra. Uh, hey, wh wh why are you calling? Hey, Josh, thank you. I speak with course creators all the time, and they, they're telling me that they're losing 6 to 8% of their revenue month over month from failed credit card payments. So I was just curious, 
How are you recovering the failed payments? Are you using like an automation? Do you have folks reaching out for you? Or are you using an outsourced recovery team? Okay, out of role play. Now let's actually dissect this for a second. So again, this is a question that is not a leading question. We're phrasing it in a multiple choice way around the problem. And we're trying to understand how they're doing this today. And what we're doing is in the ABC choices, we're making it easier for someone to answer. We're also showing credibility because we know how people are getting the job done today, right? So it's showing that, gee, I, I, I know how you're getting it, do, uh, it done today. And three, because we're that, that last choice is something that they might not have thought of before. Um, Chris Voss calls this the illusion of control. We're kind of teasing what could be. And what oftentimes they say is, what, what do you mean by outsource recovery team? That's what the gravy solution is, right? And so when you structure these questions, it's, you know, here's the kind of structure. How are you handling this today? How are you dealing with this? How are you balancing work and family life with training for an Ironman? How are you lowering the risk of? How, how are you going about doing this, right? Are you doing A? Are you doing B? Or are you doing C? So and I'm just curious, like, how, are you, how, are you, how are you doing this today? Is it like automated? You know, she improvised it a little bit. You got people reaching out or do you have like an outsource team doing this? And that's the gentle curiosity part, right? I'm not, I'm not saying to him like, hey, like how are you recovering those failed payments? Automation, you know, I'm not, this isn't a matter of fact thing because it's not matter of fact. I'm asking, I'm genuinely curious about what's going on because I don't know. Yeah, and now sometimes what happens in this script is you might be talking to, you might have a good message, but you might be talking to the wrong person. To which time you'll get the following objection. I'm not interested. Or I don't handle that. Right? So the, you'll get I'm not interested if you're talking to the wrong person. Right? So let me show you how, how we did diffuse that real gently. Right? So we're going to rope, we're going to switch roles again. I'm going to be the salesperson now. And Kendra's going to tell me she's not interested, which is, an, which is okay because they're not interested because you're not interesting to them potentially. Right? So we're just going to roll with that. So Kendra's going to say, uh, I'm, I'm not interested. Hey, you know what? Candidly, Josh, I'm really not interested. Okay, and I'm going to say this in a very calm way. Uh, that's okay. It's a diffuse, right? Or I might say, uh, that's not a problem. So the first words out of your mouth when you hear any objection, rather than trying to overcome it, you're at the bottom of the ocean. You're going to say, oh, that, that's okay. Hey, uh, Kendra, before we get off the phone, if it's not asking too much, is it because you're happy with what you have? You don't really have any failed payments or you, you just hate getting cold calls. Not that I blame you one bit. <laughs> and then you're just going to pause. And you guys can hear an audio clip of Joe doing this on last week's sales hacker webinar. It opened up the dialogue and the prospect said the following. I just don't handle that. I don't handle this. I don't handle that. I don't handle this. To which Joe said, because he had the flash objection cards, uh, that's not a problem. I know it's not your job to help salespeople that are lost, but would you be open to pointing me in the right direction? Not a problem either way. And the prospect said, you need to talk to John Smith. So great example of leveraging, maybe sometimes you connected with the wrong person, even despite your, your best uh, intentions. So in this, in this cold call, what ended up happening here is um, I raised a, an objection. I said, hey, Kendra, I don't have any failed payments. I'm using Stripe. Now, this isn't really an objection. <laughs> this is my truth, right? Because it's specific. I'm not saying call me back. That's kind of generic. That might be a brush off. This is very specific. I said, I, I don't have failed payments. I'm using Stripe. Now, the key to the cold call is Kendra might know something that I don't know. Otherwise, there's no reason for her to talk to me. So she's going to gently respond. And so this is the first thing she said. We're just going to role play this and then I'll dissect it. I said, hey, Kendra, I, I don't have any failed payments. I'm using Stripe. Using Stripe? So that's what Chris Voss calls a mirror. It is repeating the last two or three words that the other person said as if to say, tell, tell me more. When I first heard this technique, I thought that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I, that is not going to do anything. And the more I try this in my personal and my business life, it gets other people talking. It makes them listen. Mark, you've had experience with this as well. Is this helping your 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 relationships? 
uh, been married almost 10 years. I remember <laughs> first going through Chris Voss and saying, I'm going to try this on my wife when I get home. And it, incredible how it gets them talking. Yeah, it gets people talking, gets them, gets them feel hard. Another thing you can do is you can say, that's not a problem. Oh, that's okay. And then this is exactly what Kendra said. And we're going to dissect it. We're going to roll it from the beginning. So Kendra, I, I, I don't have any failed payments. I'm using Stripe. Using Stripe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use Stripe to process all my payments, so I think I'm good. Hey, if you don't mind me asking, how do you know your Stripe account isn't losing revenue, you know, behind the scenes without you knowing it? Hmm. How do you know? So let's dissect this language, right? All this language is doing is diffusing pressure. All you're doing on a cold call, your job is to diffuse pressure. The fear of your prospect of you selling them something. So if you don't mind me asking. I just out of curiosity. I'm just kind of curious, and you're, you're probably all set. How do you know? I'm like, hmm, I don't know. So I said, you know what? To be honest, Kendra, I don't think I've ever like actually logged in there. Yeah. Um, the way you can diffuse objections like I'm diffusing them is by using objection flashcards. It's a new product that I created. Shameless plug, real quick. Thirty-four of these. There's the objection on the front. And what to say on the back, you practice them like maybe you did your math multiplication tables so that when these objections come up, they feel like you're saying you're responding to five times five. So you just go to this website and you can grab a set for yourself. They also come with how to say it MP3s so you can get the tonality um, down pat. So there's one of these for each one that we're talking about here today. Um, so um, Kendra, after I said that, said, said this. Uh, so Kendra, I, I actually, I, I'm not sure. I actually don't think I've even looked into Stripe lately to see if I do have those. Josh, no problem. I promised I would be brief. Would it make sense for me to send you instructions on how to check those? I, I have a checklist for how to log into Stripe and check your failed payments. And if you have some failed payments, maybe we could talk again. Sure. I'd love that. And Kendra sent me a doc, like within five minutes, I actually logged in. And it turns out that I didn't have the problem. And I wrote her back. I almost felt compelled to write her back. And she said, no problem. Uh, keep us in mind if this ever comes up. And if it does come up, I'm definitely calling gravy. Right now, look at this language again. We talked about letting go of assumptions if you have failed payments, rather than check to see how many failed payments you have, and we'll get rid of them by 50%. Right? Because problems alone aren't enough to inspire action. If I only had one failed credit card payment, it's a problem, but it's not intense and big enough to warrant me doing anything about it. People live with problems all the time. I got a pixel out on my back TV right now. It's a problem, but I rarely watch that TV. And when I do, I barely notice the pixel. So I'm not going to fix it given all the other things I got to deal with. So just because you have a problem doesn't mean it's the green light for you to go ahead and sell anybody something. Assume the problem's small. Assume it's small. Let it unfold. So this was and a brilliant. Go ahead, go ahead, Kendra. No, I was going to say this too is a great opportunity to look at your company and see, do you have a give? Do you have something that you can freely give? And I knew that we had the instructions for how to check Stripe and Josh didn't know how to do it. So if there's an opportunity for you to give something to your prospect that's valuable or helpful to them, that also helps you feel more relaxed also because you know that you're helping. Hey, can I just give this to you? And if you look it over, maybe we can talk again. If you read through it and you find some things in there, that blah, 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 right? You can, you can do that. Yeah, the other thing too is uh, we're putting the prospect in control. Right? When, when people feel their freedom to choose is being taken away, that again creates this reaction of pressure. If I were to tell Mark, hey, Mark, we can go anywhere you want but sushi, Mark's going to want to go get sushi. Right? <laughs> it's, a, it's the same kind of idea. Tell a little kid, don't touch the wet paint. They're going to go run and touch the wet paint because their freedom of choice is being restricted. You know, would it make sense? You decide. Putting so a prospect play, in control. God can I play the other side for a second? Yeah. So yeah. By uh, Kendra playing this so gently curious by sending something that is <clears throat> should legitimately help you, has she earned the right to ask for time after you've reviewed the document to see if you have a problem? It's a great question. Um, in this case, what, and I'll let, let Kendra speak, but from my perspective, I was the prospect. Um, 
I felt this was actually better because I didn't have to spend my time booking a meeting with some sales rep that again, the sales rep wants to book a meeting again to move things forward. But I would argue I didn't have the problem and Kendra just saved her AE 40 minutes because I logged in there wasn't the problem. I told Kendra, she was like, great. And now let me go find someone that does have the problem. So it's not always, and that might be a different than the next person Kendra called. Um, but if I, ha if I did have the problem, if I did see a bunch of credit card crap, uh, failed payments. I'm like, what do I do? Let's let me learn more. Right. So, Fair enough. Sometimes, yeah, yeah sometimes um, if there's if if I have a give right, and I say, you know, could we could we talk again? Or if they just do, if they say, you know, send me an email, and I say, I would love to. Can you be really relevant and share with? Or I want to be really relevant. Could you share with me what you'd like to see in the email? And they tell me or they just say, you know, hey, send me the one pager and I'll say, hey, next Thursday afternoon, can I just give you a ring for 15 minutes and see either way what you think? And they might respond and say, well, we're going to look this over internally and I'll let you know. And I go, candidly, I'm a salesperson. I have a list of 35 people who said they'd call me back. Do you want to be 36 or could I just give you that ring? And most of the time... Yeah. They're like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so another, yeah. another way to handle that, that, that one too, we can talk a little bit about it. Let, let's just kind of go through that's another common one, which is send me some information. And remember, objections are either true or not true. And the way you know that is if they're specific. If they're specific, they're usually true. If they're vague, they're usually not. So well, let's just role play that one. Kendra, you're going to ask me for some information. I'll take you through one of the cards. We're going to be real calm about it. And we're going to see if we can't get to the truth and not waste time chasing. That one typically usually is a brush off, usually. Yeah. Not always, but let's actually role play this one, Kendra. So you're gonna say, send me some information. Yeah. Josh, could you just send me some information? That's not a problem, Kendra. What information would you like to see? Um, I'm, you know, whatever, whatever you got. Yeah, hey, I, just so I don't do the service and send you irrelevant information, would it be okay if I ask you a couple questions? Now you're gonna push back again and say, send me anything. Uh, you know, if you just have a one pager, whatever you got, that's fine. You know, I, I, Kendra, I might be misreading here, but typically when people ask me to send them a one pager, it's just a nice way of saying they're not interested, which is not a problem at all. I know you didn't ask me to call you. Is that the case here? Um, and it, it like, Josh, I'm, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So I, I actually here. appreciate that. What we're doing is we're just getting the truth, right? Not telling the yeah. send me some information card. And I'm able to do that because I've practiced that card for 15 years, um, just like you can now. And when that objection comes up, your confidence is going to come through. Where we get into trouble is we, we know what to say, but we can't do it in the moment. So when we're calm and we're confident, um, it shows, and we just get to the truth. Um, so let's actually go, go through now. Let's actually write one. And this will be great. I'm going to test my skills here. Um, for Mark. So Mark, uh, Mark and I talked this morning and I told him I did not want him to see this until the webinar. True story. I wanted his, uh, his honest feedback about how I did. And I, more importantly than the script, which might be off is the, um, thought process that I used for it. Um, the other advantage of doing cold calling nowadays is there's a service, this guy, Ryan Reiser, um, that I use all the time where instead of talking to one person an hour, he allows you to have conversations with about 15 people an hour without adding any technology. He actually dials down your list and he determines your phone picker uppers and you literally have about 15 conversations. That allows you to tweak your message really fast. Instead of taking it six months, you can dial it in. Rarely, rarely will it be tweaked up on the first go around. So step one is this. Does anyone have any idea who this is? Mark, does anyone, I, Mikey, does anyone know who this guy is and what is his superpower? Does anyone know, Mikey, what this guy's superpower is? The Star Trek guy? Sorry, I'm not. No, a, yeah, he's Star Trek guy. Patrick uh, Stewart. I saw it come in in the comments. Yeah. Ma Magneto? Dr. Xavier? Okay, what's his, what's his superpower? Move, move metal? Move metal? I'm just pointing to her head. She kind of knows. Oh. <laughs> like telekinesis? <laughs> he's able to, like, get inside your head. Telepathy. Exactly. He's able to like see what, see what your thoughts are. Yeah. Like see exactly what you're thinking. And I was watching this movie. I'm not a big like X Man thing, but I was watching this the other night, and I'm like, that would be awesome if like salespeople could actually peer inside the mind of their prospect and see exactly what they're thinking about in terms of what they hate about their job. Well, it turns out you can actually do that. And the way you do that 
is you simply take a look at the ambition case studies and testimonials for similar people you want to talk and you strip out all the marketing language. Now, Mark, when I was on your website, there were a bunch of case studies, but a lot of them weren't words coming out of your customers' mouths. They were marketing's interpretation of those words, and I can always tell what they are because they sound like this. Streamlined, optimized, increase, 10x. It's a lot of like, no, it's just marketing, but it just doesn't help us in sales because they're too vague. But I did find this guy, um, Kevin, Kevin Dorks, KD. A lot of people know him, famous guy on LinkedIn, super nice guy. And he was featured in a video that you had. And I like this because it was actually words coming out of the customer's mouth. And it turns out that your customers are betting at writing cold calls and cold emails than you are. The best way to read your customer's mind is to actually look at these customer case studies, get the language out, and then put it into the script. So when I watched this video, this is exactly what Kevin said. Uh, about a uh, minute and 52 seconds in. He was talking about a bunch of stuff, but then he lit up at the end. And he goes, you know, the coaching aspect of ambition is, my, is actually my favorite part. Now, the reason this got my ear is because there's energy behind it. Like he lit up with it. He was talking about a bunch of other stuff, but this thing, he lit up. And then he said, because it's structured, he goes, the problem with one-on-ones, when managers facilitate conversations with reps, is they're unstructured, they're all over the place. Everyone's doing their own thing and everyone's busy and they're unplanned. So they just kind of turn into muck. His words, very visceral, made you feel something very crispy around one specific problem. We never want to focus on three problems or four or five. We do X, Y, Z, D. It it overloads the brain. We want to pick one, see if it resonates. And we're going to call people like Kevin Dorsey. Yes, Kevin, if you're listening, I know there's only one of you. You're a special snowflake. But we're going to see if there's other VPs of sales in companies that manage a bunch of reps like he does that might also feel like how Kevin feels. And we're going to actually use Kevin's words in the script. So again, this is uh, if I was calling someone, I might, if I'm, I'm working for ambition. I call, I say, uh, hey, Lisa, I'm Josh. We've never met. I was on your LinkedIn. I was hoping you could help me out for a moment. Now, I have found when I do that one, for me, most of the time people will say, who is this? What's this about? And they're leaning forward. Because when you ask brains questions, they have to answer. Um, and then I'd say this. Thanks. Um, I'm with Ambition. Uh, 2,043 enterprise sales leaders are using us to coach reps remotely. And I speak with VPs of sales all the time who are really grappling with this issue of doing one-on-ones that are unstructured and unplanned. So they most of the time end up turning into muck. Then I'll just pause there. Now, let me, let me dissect this and then I'm going to get Mark's take. So the reason I'm saying in this instance, I'm working with 2,043 enterprise sales leaders, and that number might be bigger or lower, I just pick one out of the air, is to show a little credibility, like working with a lot of people like you. Give them some context. And then there's my problem statement. I'm speaking to people like you all the time who are grappling with, and I just took this language literally from Kevin Dorsey's mouth. And I used his muck term because it was so visceral. Anytime you can make someone feel something and it's casual, and I kind of laugh at the end of it. Now, Mark, I want to turn it over to you. I know we haven't spoken before about this. And I kind of wanted to get your reaction in terms of the, the problem statement, not the value proposition. But is this, is this a problem that some of your prospects potentially bump into? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a sales leader, you're, you're coaching the team to talk about pains that you solve, right? And so in coaching, and so many salespeople on this webinar, think about your recent one-on-ones, how many of them were structured, planned, documented, and you actually walked away with something beneficial for you that wasn't just a pipeline update for your boss. And when, when that happens, Mark, what terrible thing happens after that? So when, when conversations aren't structured and when they're unplanned and they turn to muck, um, what terrible, no good, very bad thing happens as a result of that? Your sales reps aren't improving and you as a SVP of sales have no clue what your managers are coaching your employees on. Yeah, I would also imagine too, as I was kind of reading more about some of these case studies, it's also like you run the risk of losing some people, right? Like too, because I'm not getting 
better and I'm not feel like I'm getting coached and I, I might, I might, you might leave a, lose a star employee. Attrition because they're not being developed. Exactly. Yeah. So then I transition to this. Hey, and I'm just, I'm just curious, Lisa, like how are you facilitating coaching one-on-ones to improve your win rates? Are they a bit like sporadic? And I'm going to validate it because everyone's just like crazy busy. Or are they structured and planned with follow-ups based on each rep's strengths and weaknesses? Now, psychology there. Why is this important to improve win rates? How are you doing it today? Are you doing this? Is it kind of sporadic over there? And not to degrade it, but because, you know, like everyone I talk to, they're crazy busy. Just so she doesn't think that she's alone. Or are they structured, which is what it could be, you know, what's possible and plan with follow-ups based on each of the rep strengths and weaknesses. And we may have a conversation here for a while, and I may use mirroring and labeling. Sounds like you're doing a lot with such a small team. Sounds like you're really running around a lot. Sounds like you're about, you'd about you love to coach more, but you just don't have the time, especially now that everyone's remote. We might just stay there. And I might give her a lot of positive accolades and positive labels. And then eventually, I might transition to, sounds like this might be interesting. It might be worth exploring. I, I know I promised I'd be brief. And then I'll use a Chris Voss, no oriented question. You know, would it, would it be a horrible idea for you to just see what other teams are doing in terms of getting a lift to close rates, sometimes up by 20%. And now look at the key phrase here. Should a need arise in the future? Now, Mark, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Okay. Why do you think I'm saying should a need arise? arise in the future because one key thing that you're doing is you're not accusing me of being a crappy coach yeah and i'm also not assuming that you need to drop everything and buy now because the pressure is created when people feel the pinch of moving forward too quick so i'm saying of course you're not in market now this subconsciously is saying i know you're not shopping but do you want to review what your options are i'm not here to sell you anything now but do you want to just see what your options are for the future? And then we're going to get a bunch of objections, maybe. And we just use these tongue-tied cards to diffuse them. All right, I want to pause here. I know we've got about 10 minutes left. And Mikey, uh, we can open it up for questions for Kendra or Mark or myself or, or you as well. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, we got some good, uh, some good questions here. So, okay. Um, Mike asked... What would your response be when implementing the poke the bear question? Um, if the prospect feels afraid to disclose that information to you because they are under the impression that their approach is unique and they don't want you to poach it. Yeah. So let's actually talk through that a little bit. So there's a couple of limiting beliefs that I might hear in that question, meaning that you're assuming that everyone's going to be afraid that they're going to not share some stuff. And when you think that way, and Kendra could talk about this as well, you end up thinking that way, you end up not doing it because mm -hmm. your thoughts affect your actions. So if you get someone that's not comfortable sharing, what would they say? They would say, I don't feel comfortable sharing. And you might say something like this, uh, that's not a problem. Sounds like I'm being really evasive. I'm just curious to know to the extent that you feel comfortable sharing, how are you guys getting that done today? And it's perfectly okay if you don't want to share. It sounds like I'm being a little evasive. Like that, that's how I would diffuse that one. But I would also not assume that everyone's going to think that. Um, you might be thinking that in your head. And again, when you think that in your head, you're going to think, I'm not going to try this because everyone's going to do that. You've already talked yourself out of it. <laughs> that's, and that's the, that's the biggest part, right? With the moment that we start thinking or deciding what somebody else's response is going to be is the moment we're building this brick wall in front of our path. And we're doing that because we don't want to feel embarrassed or uncomfortable. It's not that we're actually unprepared or whatever we're telling ourselves, right? We create these illusionary stories in our mind where we decide what somebody else is feeling or thinking because truthfully, if we separate that out and peel it away, it's because we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to mess up and feel embarrassed or dumb or belittled. But again, you're in charge of your attitude and your emotions. They're not. So whatever they show up with, you decide how you feel. And that also goes in reverse, just like Josh mentioned. 
release the assumption, detach from the outcome of what they're saying. You can only learn to detach if you understand why you're attached first. So my challenge for everybody this week is to take time on a scrap sheet of paper and write when you begin negative talk, negative self-talk or negative talk. Learn first to become aware of your own patterns of when you decide what someone else is going to feel, say, or think, and then how you chastise yourself over different things. Your awareness will then help you detach. And all of a sudden, these ideas that you are spinning to yourself because you don't want to do something for a different reason, start to float away. I love that. And a great, a great kind of tool to speak to pretty much Kendra that you just said, The Four Agreements, fantastic book. It actually helped me quite a bit in terms of cold calling because it's all about that. Be impeccable with your word. No assumptions. Try your best. And the third, the other one is, is slipping my mind. But Honestly, if you follow that and go into the call with that kind of mentality, then, and an open mind at least, like, you know what, let's just have a conversation or at least try to have a conversation, then the chances of actually booking that meeting is significantly higher. At least that's- but, here's the, but here's the thing, that's, this is the thing, don't focus on the chances of booking the meeting being significantly higher, right? Because you yeah. can feel it creeping in, right? And so the attitude is we're letting go of assumptions. We're going to, we have something that we think can help. Some people want to have a conversation with us. Some people won't, and that's okay. We're going to have some conversations. We're not going to focus on a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. Um, okay, I think we got another good one here. Um, okay, Josh, this one's for you from Joe. You often speak about being crispy, but also having to cut the fluff. How do you balance the two, i.e., how do you be descriptive or visual without using a lot of words? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, crispy and succinct. So just because you're specific doesn't necessarily mean you have to be lengthy. I'll give you an example. So Mark is into triathlons. Um, and let's assume that Mark is doing some longer triathlons and I know that most of the time when people are not professional triathletes, if they're not runners, that one of the problems sometimes they have is that they have to walk the last six miles of a, an Ironman race, right? That's, like, that's a hypothesis that I have. So if I cold call Mark to be very crispy, I might say something like this. Hey, hey Mark, I often hear that athletes can get out of the water okay and they're good on the bike but the last 10 miles of the run feels like a Frankenstein walk. That's crispy. Frankenstein walk is kind of like Mark kind of nodding his head. Like, yeah, that's very visceral. feels like a, feels like you're like, you know, crawling. You know, so you can be crispy without being lengthy. Josh, can I add to you that one of the things that I see in this layout that you went through is that the crispiness it, it really comes early as a credibility piece that like I see you person I'm talking to. And then it also comes at the end as a, a further confirmation after they know you see them, you really see them. And now you've made your ask maybe a, a strong word there, but you're, you're, you're end. Yeah, it's great observation. Uh, there's a guy, um, Armand Farquhar over at, at, at PAVE. He does a, a great example, one of the best examples of crispy, specific, and succinct that I've ever heard. And uh, follow him if you're not, but this is this was great. I had him on a podcast a couple months ago. So merit spreadsheets, maybe Mark knows about these. I don't. I never even heard of these before, but apparently at the end of the year, you got a bunch of reps, got to figure out what you want to pay them based on their on-target earnings, their territories, how long they've been with the company, the options. These spreadsheets times 30 reps get to be a lot of columns. Like that's just how people are getting the job done today. So I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but when Armand calls, he says something like this. Um, uh, my name is Ar Armand with, uh, with, with Pave and we're, we're running a competition. And the prospect usually says, about what? And he says, we're seeing the maximum number of columns you have in your merit spreadsheet. The current record is QV. Can you beat it? Now, everyone on this call, especially Mark, because he sounds like he may have done this, is kind of laughing, but that's very specific because QV implies that you've kind of gone through AZ and then you have to repeat it again. That's very specific. That's not saying increase your optimization. It's one of the best examples that I've ever heard around a specific problem that's crispy and visceral 
meaning it makes you feel something. It's kind of like that muck example. And all in one sentence. You know, so it's another another great example. And according to Armand, he told me like, you know, eight out of ten times, it opens it opens up the conversation. Yeah. I love this. This is fantastic, guys. Okay, let's try and get one more in and then we'll uh we'll call it for the day. Mark, I got this one for you. Um so someone asked, they made a lot of calls. Um and then hang up right away after hearing a voice. I hate mm. that because there are times when I do really do it really well and get past it, but also, um, you know, I'm fearful of rejection, thinking that I suck. So I know you've managed multiple reps before and teams and kind of taught them before. What would you give? What would be your best advice to help the reps overcome the fear and doubt? Because I definitely know when I first started making these cold calls, I had that kind of fear and doubt as well. Um, but I did get over it over repetition, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think Kendra said it really well earlier about uh, not, well, one, Josh saying being detached from the outcome, but two, not letting the previous calls. And y'all, this is hard as hell. I have been in this. When you're getting told no nine out of 10 times, it's hard to forget that seven of those hung up on you and the one was a mean no and one was a nice no and you're thinking man at least just like get a nice no it's hard but being able to the football analogy is like snap and clear you got to forget the bad play that just happened and like give the current play your full attention and that's what we talk to our sales development team about is what you're really doing is you're not making the assumption like was shared earlier and you're going in with an open mind and if you can do that well, and it's really hard, and it usually takes some time and repetition to really get right, uh, then you're giving yourself a better uh, chance to win. This is, it's just practice. It takes practice, guys, and you're going to screw it up, and you're going to stumble, and you're going to negative self-talk, and you're going to make up these stories. But the, the mindfulness definition, right, awareness of the present moment, not living in the what ifs of the future, nor reviewing or regretting the past. Each call is its own moment in time, and you get to decide to separate the call from the emotion and allow it to float away ahead of you. And it takes practice, but you can take each call as its own moment. And can I talk to the early SDR just real fast? Because I'm sure we have some on here that are like, damn it, I get told no all the time. This is a grind. This job sucks. Being able to to have that mindset approach and to overcome those no's and, and not overcome the no's, but overcome that no in your mind. As a VP of sales who is interviewing and hiring for you know enterprise sales reps, one of the most important attributes, even in that role, is being able to get your foot in the door well, right? And that you early SDR who's paying attention, that skill set is so marketable that when you can learn how to do it well, and it starts between your ears, that that can follow you later on in your career. So I always really feel for those new SDRs and them walking into that role and getting used to that grind. Uh, that can become one of your biggest uh, assets as you carry forward should you continue on in a sales role and probably outside of a sales role. Yeah, and I think too, one thing that, that's helped me, Mark, and I realize this late in my life, I don't know if you you have as well, and this is not like just about sales, but the shift for me happened when I realized that I don't control other people. Like I don't control how other people behave, how they respond, how they interpret. The debilitating feeling of rejection always happens when I'm attaching my self-worth to the outcome. When you're attaching your self-worth to the outcome and you don't get it, you feel less than. Now, the truth is that you're the prize and that your worth has more to do than your cold call. And they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting the message, <laughs> which really has nothing to do with your self-worth. Take me to church, Josh. <laughs> that is church. good. Yeah, because <laughs> because a lot of account, a lot of great account executives, sales development reps. I mean, they are controlling every controllable, and that is good. But you also have to understand what you don't control, and uh, coming to the realization that Josh is a human, and as much as he likes market ambition, he may not be able to buy this quarter. 
uh, for a very legitimate reason, it happens. There were all sorts of things we couldn't control in that flip the script bus, Mark. I mean, we just couldn't control a lot of things. <laughs> that was a good That's practice. Right. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, guys. Well, I know we're a couple minutes over time. Thank you, everybody, for joining the call today. This was a fantastic event. Honestly, I learned so much from you guys. It was amazing. Um, so quick, uh, quick kind of outro here. Honestly, go, go, go to LinkedIn. Find Kendra, Josh, and Mark. Um, connect with them. If, they have, if you have any questions, feel free to hit them up. I'm sure they'll uh, take the time to get back to you when they can. Um, again, this is going to be a recording. It'll be sent to all of the attendees as well as the, the, registra uh, the registrants. So thank you so much. Massive shout out to Ambition for sponsoring this, uh, this webinar. Go check them out. They're so awesome. Love Love hanging with them. So I really appreciate um, the speakers, Josh, Kendra, Mark. Thank you so much for being here. I had a blast. Um, and I'm really looking forward to next time. So Probably. thanks.